Welcome back to Likeable Science, live from the Eco Days Symposium. Uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and we're broadcasting today from the uh, East West Center of the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, the East West Center is hosting the, this Eco Days, which is, stands for Ecological Dissertations in Aquatic Sciences, I believe. Mm -hmm. And yeah. with me today, I, I have two uh, participants in this uh, Whitney Beck from uh, Colorado State and Aaron Larson from Columbia. Cornell. Cornell, sorry. Other, the other part of New York. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you guys, I gather, actually are collaborators already. EcoDays is all about bringing collabor collaborators together. You already were collaborating before the EcoDays, right? Correct, yeah. So Whitney and I share a common ancestor. So her advisor, Lori Poff, is also on my dissertation committee. But funnily enough, here at EcoDays, we're working on two very independent projects and getting to know some other folks as well. But it's also a fun chance to reconnect. Excellent, excellent. Isn't, isn't that peculiar the way, the way uh, people's uh, pedigree, as it were, in science sometimes, uh, very different people in very different places end up having common ancestors, as you put it, sort of. Excellent. So... Um, Let's, let's start by, by maybe a, a very brief, non-technical explanation of what, what each of you, what your project really is. But you want to start? Sure. So my project is about stream algae. I study um, freshwater algae that grow on rocks. You might have been fishing or swimming in streams or lakes and got it caught in your fishing line or sl slipped in a stream because it's so slippery from the algae. Um, but I study um, nutrients in streams, so fertilizers that maybe come from agricultural fields or wastewater treatment plants, and how they influence the growth of algae and how to prevent issues with water quality, like what we're seeing in Florida, for instance, um, and some of the freshwater streams where there's a lot of nutrients and that's fueling growth and leading to fish kills and things like that. So I'm conducting experiments to try to understand how algae, algal growth responds to nutrients under different conditions, like different temperatures and stream flows and things like that. Um, so it involves a lot of field experiments up in the beautiful Colorado mountains, but also some quantitative models from larger data sets. Excellent, excellent. And Aaron? Yeah, so I work a little bit up in scale from Whitney in terms of the animals that I study. So I work on stream insects. So if you've ever gone fly fishing, whatever you tie it on the end of your line, like a mayfly, caddisfly, stonefly, is what I study. Um, also mosquitoes, true flies that you might not like quite as much. And so what I try to understand are the processes that shape how many different species of those types of stream insects we find in a stream, especially things like landslides or floods or other types of what we call disturbances that might influence whether we see a lot of different types of bugs in one stream or just a few. Yeah, okay. So I, I, I can see the, the, your work interestingly complements one another, certainly, mm -hmm. at this point. And so going, going to your, back to your work, uh, the, the, uh, you talked about the pesticides and fertilizers. In some sense, those things are sometimes putting sort of uh, counteracting influences on the algae. Right? Some of it may be harming the algae, slowing its growth. Others of it may be feeding the algae and enriching its growth. But all in all, mm -hmm. the disturbances probably are making the uh, algae growth different than it, than it was before before the land was being used, right? Yeah, that's right. So I don't study as much the pesticide side of things, okay. but and I don't think as much as as much is known in that area about how pesticide runoff is influencing algae. Maybe it's influencing insects that <laughs> feed on algae, um, but definitely the nutrient side of things. You look up in the Colorado mountain streams and you would actually expect them to be a lot more pristine than lower elevation streams. But in fact, what we do um, in the lower elevations influences the conditions in the mountains. So we have um, cattle farms and concentrated animal feeding operations that are emitting nitrogen and nutrients into the atmosphere, and those end up in the mountain streams. We also have car emissions in um, the Colorado kind of lowlands, and those bring nitrogen up into the atmosphere, and then it gets deposited as rain in those high elevation areas. So they can be even more polluted than streams in town. Oh, huh, interesting. Yeah, because we tend to think of everything as running downstream. It's really counterintuitive. Yeah, that, that you through the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a great reason why you want to be at Eco Days here, right? To get some atmospheric scientists working with you to help track those sources and exactly. quantify the, 
the transport, right? Yeah, and I'll mention that there was a really great program at my university that was funded by the National Science Foundation. So I came in as a fellow in this program, and it was meant to get atmospheric scientists, watershed scientists, and social scientists to collaborate together on water issues. So I made friends in engineering and atmospheric scientists who I've been able to work with on different projects, and that's been so helpful at my university, and I'm extending the net here at EcoDays. Excellent. And of course, all this then really, it, it has implications clearly for the health of the streams you're studying, right, in terms of the, the fish populations and then the viability of the streams and the usability for people. Yeah, there's no point to fishing a stream where all the fish are dead, right? Of course. Uh, but also, it really then deals with, with water quality issues, right? I mean... Yeah, so in the newspapers recently, I've been seeing pictures from Florida where lifeguards are wearing gas masks. So there are toxins that are coming from the algae, and they get aerosolized. They're in the atmosphere, and people are breathing those in. So there's signs on beaches telling people with asthma or telling small children not to go in that area. And the algal toxins coming into the air is something I hadn't thought a lot about because we don't really get that in Colorado, but in places like Florida, that's been a real problem. Although, actually, I was reading something fascinating a while ago that pointed out that the ocean, the viruses that they've got discovered now in the ocean are so numerous and get blown off the ocean surface, basically, and get up into the upper atmosphere and they circle a globe. And wow. something, like, something like every square meter of land on Earth gets some, a load of something like 875 million viruses per day landing on it. <laughs> Yikes, our, our bodies are amazing that we can resist that. Right, yeah. I mean, yeah. We, we think we'd rapidly be up to our knees in, in viruses, but Definitely. fortunately they're very small and all. And, and so uh, I guess in a sense, we're, we're going to look at sort of some similar issues with, with, the, with the insects. Uh, so a lot of people would say, hey, so who cares how much the insects you know, in a stream die or don't die? You know, big deal. So the fish eat a little bit more, a little bit less. Who cares? What, what's, what's the imp imp impact of this for people? Yeah, so that's a great question and one that people often ask me about because I think when we think about aquatic insects, a lot of people think about mosquitoes or black flies or some of the more mean to humans <laughs> um, aquatic insects that'll bite you or transmit disease and things like that. But actually, a lot of aquatic insects play a really important role in the carbon cycle. So when we think about those headwater streams, you might also often think about a stream that has trees over it. And so when those leaves fall off the trees and go into the stream, the insects are the ones that are eating the leaves and playing a really important role in how carbon is transported in the system. Um, they also feed birds when they hatch out of the stream in their aerial farm. They're little like nutrient bags. They have a bunch of fatty acids in them. Um, so they're really important for a lot of bird populations and spiders and other types of terrestrial of course, animals. You often see birds flying low over the streams, right? Exactly. They're, they're essentially snatching water mm -hmm. hatching or, or right, right off the surface there. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. And again, the, they're very much dependent upon what runs into the stream, right? So we touch on pesticides and we said she couldn't really speak that so much, but do, do the pesticides then actually Im influence these, uh, these larval stages of these insects? They do, yeah. So a pesticide is designed to kill insects, right? Mm -hmm. And so they also kill aquatic insects when they enter into streams. And so a lot of people, we don't have as much data on aquatic insects as we do on terrestrial insects. So things like bumblebees or um, other important insects like that. But we do know that when pesticides get into streams, they can kill a lot of the insects that live in streams as well. So I was just reading recently a rather alarming report that suggests that a lot of insect populations of lots of different kinds of insects in lots of different places in the world, but most of them are terrestrial that have been studied so far, are the insect populations are just crashing massively, in some cases dropping tenfold, fiftyfold, uh, just in a few decades. Are, we, wow. are you seeing any of this in, in stream insects? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I'm going to try and answer that to the best of my ability. So one limitation with aquatic systems is we just don't have quite as long an, a data record. So when you do a study like that where you're showing that something's declined, you really need data from before we started impacting those mm -hmm. systems. Um, and so we have seen some evidence that pesticides and other types of um, pollution are affecting aquatic insects. We know that it affects aquatic insects and that different ways of basically hurting bugs' homes, so harming or um, rearranging streams in different ways does affect their biomass or the amount of them that we find in a stream. But we don't 
right now have quite enough data to do those really big global scale syntheses of like, okay, do we know that aquatic insects are declining? My sense is yes, um, and I'd love to explore that further with my research. For yeah, sure. I, I would think some records love, like the fishing records from streams could probably give you some insight, right? If there used to be a lot more people catching a lot more fish out of the, the river, it would suggest that... That there might be. Yes, yeah, so you're getting at this idea of right. like, okay, that fish Classic. need to eat food, so if their food is right. no longer there and we're seeing less fish, but if right. people have been taking the really big fish out, right. there's all kinds of things that can lead to us finding more or less fish. Sure. So. Yeah, sure. it's hard to say if that's caused right. by insects or not. Again, this is a great a great reason though to be here at Eco Days, right? And you know, talk to other people, look, look at some of these other factors, and can help tease some of that out, eliminate some as, as a possible compound, and track others that might be really worthwhile and, and might be very meaningful in your work, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, it's been fun to meet a lot of different folks thinking about aquatic systems, especially. Since we both study streams, meaning some people who think more about saltwater systems and, you know, the ocean or coastal estuaries and things like that and how the processes that are going on there might be different. But of course, all your streams ultimately, ultimately they all feed in the yeah. ocean, right? It so all goes to the ocean, exactly. <laughs> classic ecology lessons, right? That everything is connected to everything else. You can't really pull one piece out without starting to unravel further, right? It's a great summary. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's intriguing. So... Um, how, how did you get sort of started? I mean, these seem sort of like odd things to be studying in their, in their own way. I know all, all scientists sort of seem to be studying odd things, but but can you, can you for people who might might not be so familiar with science, can you sort of say a little bit about how you got involved in this? What, what drew you into it? Yeah, so I'm at Colorado State University right now, but I grew up in Maryland and spent a lot of time at the beach and fishing in lakes and streams that feed into the Chesapeake Bay, which is one of the largest estuaries and has been in decline for a long time. The fisheries and the oysters are declining. There's a lot of nutrient and sediment pollution that's leading to algal blooms in the bay. So from an early age, I learned a lot about that system. And I started going to the University of Maryland as an undergrad and began an environmental science program. And my family was like, Whitney, you're going to save the Chesapeake Bay. That is your destiny. <laughs> and it was just this responsibility. I was always interested in water and how it connects from the agricultural farms to the streams to the estuaries and that whole cycle, how pollutants could be transferred and how the biological systems um, depend on what happens outside of the streams as well. So it was a fascinating topic. And we had a lot of great case studies and courses at the University of Maryland that got me started. But then I interned at the EPA's Office of Water in Washington, D.C., and kept hearing people talk about nutrients and algae, and I was like, don't we have this solved yet? I've been hearing about this for a long time. There have been plans for 30 years to save the bay, so what's missing? And that's why I decided to go to graduate school to complete some experiments, try to create better models so that we can predict and pre pre prevent these algal blooms, essentially. Yeah, so I have a maybe slightly similar, slightly different story. Um, I grew up on Long Island Sound um, in Southeast Connecticut. And so I grew up similarly by the beach, but I spent a lot of di time diving as a um, kid in high school. Um, and so I was always really, I love fish um, and I loved fishing. I liked seeing fish in the water. And when I went to undergrad, I went to um, college in New Hampshire and wasn't near the ocean anymore, but got to work on freshwater systems in Colorado and started to get really interested in streams um, learned more about algae, actually. <laughs> so went from the very big to the very small. Um, and after college, kind of was at that point where you don't really know what you want to do with your life, which might be a permanent state of being. Um, and so I went out to Idaho and worked for the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, went back to fish, and learned a little bit more about how we manage natural systems um, at a very local level. And that got me really interested, sort of similarly to Whitney, about how I could learn more to help solve the problems that we were thinking about at Fishing Game. I was always thinking about what about the things that the fish are eating? What about the things that are eating the fish? Like sort of the system as a more sort of large connected whole. And that's what got me back to grad school, thinking more about things at a community and ecosystem level with my research at Cornell. Excellent, excellent. And these both tie in nicely, again, to looking at sort of why you're doing the science in terms of sort of the, the betterment of human beings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is great. Science, you're always... Sort of, I think keep that in the back of its head, right? Is is you really want to be making the world a better place, not 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 the contrary, right? And 
it's it's intriguing that uh, we both uh, are looking at these these issues of water. There's very interestingly parallel work going on here in Hawaii. They're now trying to figure out the groundwater mm-hmm. reservoirs of Hawaii because mm-hmm. again, it seems like something that should have been solved a long time ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you should know how much water is here, but really the models are typically are using 80 year old models and they're really very, very crude and simplistic. Uh, and so it's, uh, again, people have continued to dig deeper into them, study them more now and trying to use modern techniques. So are, are you guys are finding collaborators here at EcoDays, people who can help you look at either streams from elsewhere or look at other systems that are related to your streams or monitor the output of your streams? Yeah, that's right. So I found a really fun group to work with. Um, we're interested in using a large data set that was collected by the Environmental Protection Agency as well as state partners like Hawaii. Um, and so the data set includes thousands of points from lakes, streams, coastal areas, and wetlands. And we're interested in looking at what drives the nutrients in those ecosystems. So we're going to look at how land use and climate might be influencing the nutrients in the water and then eventually connect that to the biology, like algae and insects. Excellent. That's, that's such a hot trend these days, is taking existing data sets that were gathered for some other purpose mm-hmm. and re-examining them now through a different lens and say, well, what, what can this tell us about my question? So that's, that's, Which is really exciting because you know. we spend so much time and money collecting this data, and then if it's just going to sit on a shelf somewhere, right. it's useless. But when you get people who know streams and lakes and coastal areas together in one room, we can really take a big picture view across those ecosystem types. I'm really excited to be working with this group. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, no, it, it sounds great. And I, again, with the, the history that this group has, uh, this being the 13th Eco Days, you probably have people who were asking related questions from some mm-hmm. of the early cohorts who now have access to other, other data sets that you might, might find interesting, right? Yeah. yeah, that's why it's good to keep talking to people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You never know what, what somebody else gathered, right? It's, exactly. It's, it's one of the, the, the real issues we find these days, right, is there's so much information out there. You, how do you look it up? How do you access it mm-hmm. and sort of pull the, the key signal that you want out of the noise of this overwhelming uh, deluge of information, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, uh, that's, that's it's challenging. Certainly. Yeah, let us know when you figure that out. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're working on it, don't worry. That's definitely a goal. So, um, your, your advice for aspiring scientists? Yeah. Had, had to... um, my advice is that science can be one of the many hats you wear being a scientist. Um, And we're all people, we're all living on the same planet. Um, We're all stressed about maybe slightly different things, but as a scientist, I am stressed about climate change. I want to figure out solutions and figure out ways that we can have an equitable society um, and where we live on a healthy planet. And so don't don't forget that scientists are people and that it's okay to also be a mountain biker, a knitter. <laughs> Those are some of the other hats I wear. And other things as well. <laughs> and balance the science you do and the things that really bring other types of joy to your life as well. Excellent. Excellent. And for myself, I'm thinking more of incoming students at the undergraduate or graduate level who are interested in doing research. Mm -hmm. And one regret I have in graduate school is that I did not bring in partners, um, stakeholders who would be using my research Mm -hmm. until the very end of the project. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been taught more and more as graduate students that that that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to help the people let the people that are going to be using your research help you formulate your research questions Mm -hmm. and participate and um, work in the field with you and that sort of thing. And so rather than just publishing an article and hoping that someone uses it, I would encourage people to get um, the users involved Mm -hmm. early, whether that be talking to your local state water quality managers or local nonprofits or even environmental education groups. If you have modules you're producing, for instance, get people involved in what you're doing and Excited about it. Excellent. Yeah, it, it, that's on uh, in this uh, EPSCOR project that's studying Hawaii's groundwater. That's one of the things they're pushing on now is mm-hmm. being sure that every project has can identify clearly what is it going to give back to the community? Mm-hmm. What is that concrete product or process or information that they're going to contribute so you can talk to the community's value of it? Excellent. And um, then I'll tell you what, I've got, I've got my, my 
a question I, I often ask at the end of the end of these shows here as we're <laughs> coming to the end. Real quickly, it has nothing to do with science. <laughs> Great, no Real problem. Quickly, though, <laughs> like what you said about got to be have a life too, right? Mm -hmm. If you could have the superpower of flying or being invisible, which would you choose and why? Oh man, I think I would pick flying because. First of all, it would be carbon neutral, maybe, depending on how many, how much food I have to eat to be able to do it. Um, yeah, and there's just so much of the world. I've been lucky to explore so much of the world for my science, and there's so much more that I'd love to explore, and flying would be a fun way to do that. Cool. I agree. I was feeling very guilty coming here to Hawaii because of the carbon emissions on the airplane, and I probably travel once a month for work or pleasure. My husband and I love to travel to different countries, so just being able to get there while seeing everything along the way would cool. be an awesome win-win. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you both, uh, Whitney, Aaron, so much. It's been great having you here. And thank you. Great, uh, another great episode of Likeable Science, this one live from Eco Days. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.